All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Professor Joel Reardon, and this is for the University of Calgary Computer Science 526 course. Um, where we left off last class, we were talking about DNSSEC, and or we had just like broached the subject. We had discussed the different attacks on DNS, specifically DNS poisoning, and um, the solution more or less was to basically say, well, we have randomized query IDs and that's good enough and there's nothing we can do about it in a sense. And then Dan Kaminsky's attack came along and showed us that not only could you um, attack or poison the sort of leaf records, if you imagine DNS's recursive database lookup being like a, a walk on a, on a tree, but you could also poison the path along the tree, and that would allow an attacker to just trivially become a name server for any leaf node that would appear under that branch of the tree. So after that was realized and how bad that attack was, the solution was like, well, we should also randomize the port, I guess, because, you know, then increases the difficulty of an attacker performing this attack. Now, the key to remember is that DNS poisoning is mostly used to get an off-path attacker to become an on-path attacker, right? So if you are an on-path attacker, you don't need to worry about the random query ID. You don't need to worry about the random port. It's just trivial. You observe this information trivially. However, if you are an off-path attacker, you can try to guess these values, poison DNS records, and in so doing, position yourself or any computer you want to become an on path uh, computer. So this, of course, isn't the only solution to DNS is to have random ports as well as random query IDs and hope for the best. Um, there's a much better proposal called DNSSEC, which has been sort of slow to become adopted. Uh, and despite the fact that it doesn't seem to be too challenging in principle, the idea is we use these cryptographic primitives that we already have. And uh, we use that to provide security to the entire DNS system, which is a core part of the internet. So the idea is to use some cryptography to trust DNS more. So the first idea, so sort of like straw man idea we can come up with is, well, we'll just use TLS. We'll just use this secure communication channel that we already know exists. And we just add encryption for all of the communication channels. So DNS is a UDP-based protocol, so we can't actually use TLS because TLS works for TCP. But um, there is an equivalent called DTLS, which works for datagram, datagrams. And so in this sense, we just use DTLS. And the idea would then be we just secure all of the connections. So we secure the connection from the computer to the local DNS server, which is the resolver. Then we secure resolver to the root and to the TLD and to the authoritative name server, right, this sort of eight packet dance that we talked about, we just provide security for all of that. So the problem with this approach, however, is that it is not very performant. You have to recall that DNS is one of these core infrastructure that is just used all of the time. Every time you're trying to connect to a website or access some resource on the web, anytime you're converting a host name into an IP address, the DNS system is being used. And so the idea of inserting multiple round trips of handshaking to negotiate cryptographic primitives and all of the additional um, key negotiation that would happen, the pu public key, key negotiation, this would incur such a high cost that would remove DNS's very lightweight performance, right? So TLS is designed with a high amount of security, with end-to-end -end security for a lot of different um, applications. And in this sense, DNS doesn't require all of that uh, heavyweight cryptography because the thing to remember is, of course, we don't actually need to secure the communication channel. We just need to secure what you get as the result. We just want to know that the result IP hostname pairing that DNS provides us is the correct valid value, not uh, a value that's been tampered with. But we don't necessarily need to have forward secrecy or, or, or privacy for the actual communication. We just want authenticity of the results. And as well, another problem with uh, TLS-based DNS would be you can no longer do caching, right? And caching, as we saw, 
is crucial for DNS's performance as well because it prevents us from having to ping the global domain, the root domain servers and the global top level domain servers every single time we're doing a DNS resolve. If it happens that the resolver just has it in its cache, then that value is immediately provided to the, the querier as a response without having to go through the entire DNS system. <clears throat> so, if we consider a DNS record, the sort of key value pair in this distributed database, to be an atomic piece of data, the goal is that it is authentic, not to defeat eavesdroppers. So this gives us a second way of doing uh, DNS, which is that instead of having it be um, a, a secure communication, we instead just treat them more like certificates where we have a signature and where we can check the signature and as long as we know who should be the one signing these results, we're able to get a valid result. And if you think back to the tree-like structure, right, you can imagine that each node in the tree is able to sign or provide a certificate for its children. So if you know who the root is, you can check the root signature on the children, the global top level domains, and then the global top level domains can sign on behalf of the name server that should be the authoritative resolver for a particular DNS zone, and then that DNS zone can sign its own results. And if you just bootstrap your system with the root certificates for the, glo or for the root DNS servers, you're able to then validate the signatures going all the way down the chain. So, the idea is we have a verifiable signature that guarantees who generated the data and the signing is all done offline, so it doesn't happen at the time you're requesting this information. You already have these things pre-signed, and these pre-signed values are just provided to the client. So the client has to check the signatures, but the DNS servers on the in this part of the system don't actually need to generate a signature at that very moment in time. They just sign the host name and IP, this is the pair, and they can sign that once, and if it ever changes, they just sign the new value, and they can include the timestamp and the signature, so there's a, a sort of a, a built-in expiration for these certificates as well. So DNSSEC is a uh, standardized DNS security extension. It's currently been being deployed, and it's been in the state for quite a long time. Um, and the idea is that the resolver works its way from the root down to the final name server, and at each step along the way, it gets a signed statement for the next level's keys. So the root server knows the keys of the GTLDs just as it knows the IP and the host names, right? So it's not storing much more information. It was already storing, it's responsible for storing IP and hostname mapping. We just add a public key to that file as well. So it's IP, hostname, public key. And now the root name servers are responsible for knowing the IPs, hostnames, and public keys for all of the global top level domain servers, who are in turn responsible for knowing IP, hostname, and public keys for all of the zone masters or authoritative name servers all the way down. So it, if you recall this tree like structure for the database, we're now just saying that each node is associated with a public key and the parent node is aware of the public keys of all of its children nodes. Then when you're providing hostname and IP address, you also can provide a signature for the keys of the child. So the root name server knows the children's keys and is able to sign using its public key the the statement saying that this is the IP hostname and public keys. And so as you're following down, you gain trust into who the or what the public keys of a particular node are below and what the public keys are for the node below that. And the result is you're able to, without knowing ahead of time what the public key for a particular name server that you're looking up is actually, what, what it actually is, you're able to see you're able to gain confidence in it because you have this chain of trust going all the way to the root and you know the root keys just because it's pre-configured or pre-installed into your computer. Uh, again, this is only constant more data, so it's not that anyone needs to store a large amount of data in addition to what they were already storing. They just need to store a tiny bit more data corresponding to the, the signing keys for each of the DNS servers along the way. The final answer is then signed by the authoritative DNS server. And so 
once you, for instance, you're looking up ucalgary.ca, once you enter into the ucalgary.ca zone master, it's able to say ucalgary, www.ucalgary.ca's IP is this, its host name is what, what was being requested, and here is a signature with my public key, and as well, here is an entire chain of support from higher levels. That is, my public key was signed by the public key of the global top-level domain, and the global top-level domain's public key was signed with the root, uh, root DNS name server's public key and then all of this is given to the client. So the client gets all the keys and all of this chain of support can validate the chain of support, thereby ensuring that the key that is used to sign the DNS result is actually the one that is vouched for by this chain of support. That is that the walk on the tree was done, was done uh, correctly. And as well, one nice thing is that all of these results are cacheable, meaning that you don't have to store any additional information or generate it at runtime, but rather the the signature of a particular IP host name or the signature for a chain as part of the chain of support is able to just be stored along with the IP and host name. So wherever caching would have already been done, this can continue to be done in the context of DNSSEC. You just also cache these, this chain of support.